I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Britt Anderson. Dr. Anderson is a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Norton Children's Hospital and associate professor for the University of Louisville School of Medicine. She completed medical school at Northwestern University, residency at Lurie Children's Hospital, and fellowship at Cincinnati Children's Medical Center prior to joining the faculty at the University of Louisville in 2014. Uh, she currently also has an academic appointment as Vice Chair for Advocacy for the Department of Pediatrics. So Dr. Anderson is going to talk to us about heat-related illnesses today. And Dr. Anderson, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that um, introduction and for the opportunity um, to speak today to you all. Um, my talk, as uh, Dr. McDonald said, is on heat-related illness in children. Um, and I hope it's helpful this time of year, certainly. Um, so today we'll talk about the epidemiology of heat-related illness, certainly talk about the spectrum of presentation of heat-related illness, um, along with appropriate treatment strategies for each, and then we'll spend a, 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 some time at the end talking about prevention. I do not have any disclosures. I did use a bias checklist when um, preparing this uh, presentation, um, but certainly if you find any areas of unintentional bias um, throughout it, please let me know so that I can correct that. So we'll start with the obligatory heat-related illness definition slide, um, but it is important to, so that we're all on the same page. So heat-related illness can be defined as a clinical spectrum of disorders resulting from exposure to excessive environmental heat coupled with the body's inability to effectively regulate heat. And so core body temperature is really impressively, I think, regulated by the hypothalamus usually. And of course, usually ranges from uh, 97 to 99 degrees, um, but sometimes uh, things can go wrong. Um, so these this physiologic adjustments are made to maintain normal temperature range despite changes in ambient temperature and heat that the body produces by metabolism and physical activity. So I don't mean to make this a, a in-depth physics discussion, but it is helpful to consider the four main mechanisms that the body uses for heat transfer, as this can help inform who's at risk for heat-related illness, um, and then also uh, talks about our prevention strategies. So first is radiation, which is the heat transfer through infrared rays. So if the ambient temperature is cooler than the body temperature, then there's heat transfer. Um, and so of course, as it gets hotter outside, and certainly if the ambient temperature is warmer than a normal body temperature, then this mechanism isn't as effective. Conduction is heat transfer through physical contact with something. So like the woman in this picture is holding a cold bottle of water to her head, assuming it's cold, heat will be transferred from her um, Anybody that's been in an over air conditioned room and wearing shorts and sat down on a metal chair knows certainly that that um, direct physical contact results in heat transfer. Convection is heat transfer through movement of air or water. So how she's fanning herself, um, there will be heat transfer by convection, um, fans, opening a window, even swimming the movement of water over the body helps. And then lastly is evaporation, which is heat transfer when liquid is converted to a gas. And of course, this is why we sweat. And so it does mean that there's some truth to the old joke, like, yeah, it's hundred degrees, but it's a dry heat. You actually are um, better able to transfer heat if there's a lower humidity. So there is a spectrum of heat related illness, of course, and it ranges from very mild, just need some reassurance all the way to life-threatening. Um, and so you start with heat rash, cramps, Edema, I'm not going to spend as much time on today because it's less common in the pediatric population, um, but can happen with heat exposure, heat exhaustion, and then, of course, heat stroke. Miliaria, um, or heat rash, is a really common thing, also sometimes called prickly heat, um, that is seen by pediatricians. It's caused by blocked eccrine sweat glands or ducts. And the reason why I'm taking us back to histology with this picture is because there's three types of miliaria and they can be distinguished by how deep the obstruction is occurring in the skin. So the first, the most superficial is miliaria crystallina. And so this occurs when there's blockage of the ducts at the level of the stratum corneum. And it's so very superficial in the skin. It creates these little clear vesicles that actually sometimes if you run your hands gently over them, some of them will just fall off. It's that superficial. There's no associated inflammation. Um, so they're not red. There's no surrounding redness. They don't scab or ulcerate as they fall off. 
And this can be helpful to differentiate them from vesicles caused by like HSV, for example. Um, and so this results quickly within 24 hours without any um, intervention needed. Miliaria rubra is um, a little bit deeper obstruction <clears throat> in the epidermis. Um, and it, there is a little associated inflammation around the duct and that's what causes its characteristic red color. Um, so you will often see this. So let's say uh, you're seeing a three month old in your clinic, the family comes in, they're extremely worried about a rash that their child has developed. Um, you get further history and the baby's doing well, there's no fever, they're feeding, they're not fussy, everything else is great, except for this really impressive looking rash. And so you look down at the baby in the car seat um, and you just see a tiny little portion of their face poking out um, and you unwrap three layers of blankets and take them out of their fleece onesie and then take off uh, their other onesies and then their undershirt and you finally get down to the baby and they have a rash that looks like this picture. Um, and so this is pretty classic um, heat rash. And so your, um, it, a lot, your history along with just the, the fact that it's hot outside or they're really bundled up can be helpful. This does take a week or two often to clear. Treatment is really just talking to the family about, you know, let's, they don't need as many layers. Let's let the skin breathe a little bit. You can apply topical corticosteroids. Um, but again, you just want to balance that with, you just don't want to obstruct those sweat glands. So sometimes less is more and a little reassurance is all you need. Miliar profunda is a deeper, um, Miliaria, and I apologize that I, I could not find good pictures of um, different skin tones for this sort of rash, but it's actually more rare in kids, but does happen sometimes in adolescents. And so it's caused by blockage of those ducts at the level, but the epidermis into the dermis. And so you get these flesh colored papules that actually can be pretty annoying. I, you know, they can be um, pruritic and painful and they can take a while to go away. So let's move on to another case. So of the, of the dizzy runner. Um, and so you're in clinic um, kind of wrapping up in the afternoon and you get a frantic call from a parent wondering if they could add their kiddo on this afternoon. Um, and so you agree to see her. Um, and the story is she's 15 years old and she just finished her cross country practice. Um, she was complaining of a headache and dizziness after she finished running. And in fact, they described that she sat down and actually maybe fell asleep briefly. It's a little hard to tell what went on. But they put her in the car and it was air conditioned and they gave her a sports drink and she's feeling much better now, back to her usual self. You get vitals and there they are. Um, and you do a careful physical exam and it's normal. So what's the diagnosis here and what else do you need to do? So here's where we continue to talk about the spectrum of heat related illness. And this is pretty consistent with heat exhaustion. So exhaustion, heat exhaustion can be defined as you can have an elevated body temperature, but it shouldn't be e extremely elevated. So you're less than 40 degrees Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit. Mental status is generally okay. You can have some brief confusion or even syncope, um, but it should clear quickly. And then it's generally like headache, fatigue, dizziness, tachycardia, nausea. And the mainstays of treatment are moving them to a cooler place, um, hydration, Certainly if you have ongoing concerns for electrolyte derangement, checking and correcting those. So vast majority of the time, what she's already done um, in, before she got to your office is sufficient treatment. And then just spending time talking with the family about the risks of heat related illness um, and staying cool and resting. And you can, it's not uncommon to also see cramps, syncope. You can be well hydrated and have heat related illness, um, but they often go hand in hand. Let's contrast this with uh, another case that we actually is based on a, a case we recently saw um, here. And that is of a 17 year old um, who came into the emergency department and he was brought by an ambulance um, with altered mental status. And he collapsed while playing football. Um, and so the people on the scene called the ambulance. He had not been sick at all or had any fevers and he's otherwise a really healthy person. So EMS appropriately um, took off his um, equipment and a lot of his clothing and applied oxygen and ice um, and obtained an axillary temperature of 97.4 and brought him in quickly to the emergency department. So here's how we looked in our ED. Um, so a rectal temperature was 107.4 Fahrenheit or 41.9 Celsius. You can see that he is um, tachycardic pretty impressively tachypnic. He's not hypoxic. 
but he is hypotensive. And his exam is significant for he's really ill appearing, groaning, very minimally responsive. He does not have any signs of trauma. He does not have any focal neurologic abnormalities, but he does have a GCS of seven and his skin is warm and dry. So obviously a pretty sick kiddo. So here we've reached the end of the spectrum at heat stroke. Um, and so the main, the def defining features of this are central nervous system dysfunction um, that persists, and then a core temperature of greater than 40 degrees Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit. And this quickly leads to um, multi-organ failure if it's not corrected, because at this temperature, um, it, particularly once you head up into 106, 107 um, and above degrees Fahrenheit, the heat becomes cytotoxic, proteins denature, um, leading to end organ damage. <clears throat> so let's just take a moment to, again, it's a spectrum and things in medicine are rarely in nice neat little buckets like they're supposed to be. But there's obviously a big difference between the runner that you saw in the office and this football player. And so how do you know what to do, right? Um, and so let's review this again. Um, so heat exhaustion, uh, your, your core temperature is less than 104 or 40 degrees Celsius, um, and you do not have persistent altered mental status uh, as opposed to heat stroke. And I think really nicely demonstrated in this case is the importance of getting a core body temperature. EMS did an absolutely appropriate thing in cooling this patient, but you could see um, if you're applying cooling mechanisms, um, there's a lot of vasodilation, the um, temperatures, axillary, temporal are just not accurate. Um, and so that's why you just have to get a core temperature. Neurologic, you know, again, heat, exhaustion, the dizziness, headache, fatigue, confusion that resolves, as opposed to seizures, ataxia, delirium, combativeness, um, syncope, coma, and pupil changes. Cardiovascularly, anybody certainly can have tachycardia and tachypnea along the spectrum. But when you're getting into heat stroke, you start worrying about high output heart failure, hypotension, arrhythmias. From a GI standpoint, of course, you have vomiting and diarrhea. But heat stroke, again, you get hematemesis, hematochesia, liver and renal failure. <clears throat> and then sometimes there's a myth out there that if you just have heat exhaustion, you're sweaty. And if you have heat stroke, you're dry. And while this certainly can be true, it's not necessary. So you can be sweaty or dry with heat stroke. Um, and you can even start to develop coagulopathy, which can lead to purpura. So why does all this happen? Um, so the body, as we talked about, can compensate for, with uh, heat for a while. So either you have heat that your body's making through exercise or you have exposure to ambient heat or a combination of both that stresses the body. It increases the metabolic rate and the core body temperature increases and you start to sweat. Um, so you're having evaporative heat loss. You have um, increased cardiac output and then you vasodilate so you can, your skin uh, has increased blood flow. And this is so you can transfer heat in the other mechanisms that we discussed earlier. But this leads, can lead to decreased visceral blood flow. And so if you're able, if the heat is manageable, um, you can stay here and it's okay, you can compensate. But if the heat stress goes on too long or is too hot, it can lead to this process going off the rail. So you can have um, hypotension, um, and then all of this can lead to uh, cell anoxia, you get GI permeability because of the decreased visceral blood flow and hypotension, cardiovascular collapse, and you start to get the old big time inflammatory reaction and you get SIRS um, going on. So you get your liver dysfunction, acute renal failure, coagulopathy, um, et cetera. And this is heat stroke. <clears throat> So heat stroke can be dichotomized sometimes when you read about it into two um, classes. So first is exertional heat stroke. And this is something we often see in kids. Um, so this is when, again, the body is making more heat, which requires heat dissipation um, and particularly problematic in football players in August, that will, as our case kind of illustrates. And we'll talk about why that is. But unfortunately, it is um, a common cause of death in athletes. Um, Exertional heat stroke can also be seen though in young people in the military and those who work outside. We don't know the exact incidence of 
heat related illness, exertional heat related illness, because sometimes it's not reported um, or they don't seek medical care in more mild cases. But we do know that we've been seeing an increasing number of kids over the past decade um, seen in emergency departments with exertional heat related illness. Classic, on the other hand, is exposure to ambient heat, um, even though you may not be exercising. Um, and so people at particular risk for classic heat stroke are those who just have limited control over their environment. Um, so a good example are elderly folks, um, maybe if they don't have access to air conditioning during a big heat wave. Uh, the place we see this in pediatrics is of course vehicular heat stroke um, or kids that die in cars. Um, we started tracking um, vehicular heat strokes in the 90s. And since that time, an average of 37 kids are killed every year in the US um, by vehicular heat stroke. Um, so it definitely is still happening. Not surprisingly, it is more common in places with warmer weather, but you don't have to be that hot. Deaths have been seen um, in many locations and with temperatures outside as low as 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's kind of three mechanisms that vehicular heat stroke occurs. Most commonly, it's that just kiddos are forgotten in cars um, by well-intentioned parents. It's often associated with a change in routine where, oh, I'm going to take the kid to daycare and then, but I don't usually, and then the kiddo falls asleep in the back and you get a quick call and you run in just completely forgetting that they're there until it's too late. Sometimes kids can gain access to parked cars and can't get out of the car. Um, and then, I mean, who doesn't love to pretend to drive the car? It's a great hiding spot uh, if you're playing in hide and seek and then they just don't know how to um, get out. Um, and then sometimes kids are, um, intentionally left in a car, like you're just going to go run an air errand really quickly um, and the car gets hotter than anybody knew. And unfortunately, parking in the shade or rolling down a window just doesn't provide as much protection as people think sometimes. <clears throat> so risk factors for heat stroke, um, we'll run through these and then talk about why football players could be <laughs> particularly um, at risk. So obviously the weather, um, so both heat and humidity. Um, I like this term as the first time I had seen it of over motivation. Um, and I think this can happen by really well intentioned people where they want to push through and they want to do well and they want to see their kids do well. Um, but sometimes it can cross over into being a little bit dangerous when you're at sports practice. Um, underlying illnesses, both acute and chronic, so even acute viral infections, for example, have been found to have a, a slightly increased risk for heat stroke. Fitness of the participant is important. So being um, acclimated to the heat and being in good physical condition um, are helpful. Clothing, obviously what you're wearing, we talked about heat transfer. If you're wearing a lot of occlusive or heavy clothing, your body just cannot transfer heat as effectively. And then there's a long list of medications that provide that are risks. And I don't think surprisingly are beta blockers and diuretics, but a lot of medicines that kids um, use like SSRIs or sympathomimetics like for ADHD um, have been associated with increased risk. So if we go back to our poor August beginning of fall season football player, um, you obviously have hot weather, often one of the hottest months of the year. Um, you have a lot of social excitement over um, the sports season starting. Sometimes kiddos spend the summer um, in the air conditioning and playing video games. And so they may not be acclimated to heat. They may not be in their best physical condition yet. Obviously, they wear a lot of um, heavy equipment, which is protective from other injuries, but can be problematic for heat. Um, and then if you throw in there, they start their ADHD medicine for school. You can see why um, fall sports, particularly football, uh, see a high incidence of exertional heat stroke. Okay, so that's the problem. How do we treat it? So the first step in managing heat stroke is to recognize it. And so sometimes that's easier said than done. Um, obviously the season and the weather is gonna be a big key, um, but again, getting a core temperature is just so important. Um, but we do see hyperthermia as a fever really commonly in the pediatric setting. But when you have hyperthermia due to a fever, this is centrally regulated by the hypothalamus. And so typically your temperature doesn't go a whole lot higher than 41 or 105.8. You know, definitely see that with viruses, um, assuming the, the kiddo is neurologically typical. Um, so a patient with sepsis can have a similar presentation. Um, and so you want to look for other signs or symptoms that might tip you off that it's sepsis. 
We certainly see patients with hyperthermia and seizures due to ingestions. Actually, one not long ago of a, a, a little kiddo with um, hyperthermia and a seizure activity and ended up being a cocaine exposure. Um, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So you want to consider their medication history. You can also look for rigidity on their exam and then metabolic, metabolic abnormalities. <clears throat> so you may want to, uh, what often happens in real time is we're assessing for a lot of these things all at the same time. But if heat stroke is um, reasonably high up on your differential, you do not want to delay cooling while you figure it out. Um, and that is because delays in cooling simply lead to worse outcomes. And that's, as we talked about before, just the more time you spend at those really high temperatures when the body can't control it, the more damage is done. So treatment um, can be started on the scene and continued in the hospital. Um, and so if you receive a call from a parent who's worried about their kid at practice, there's there's really important things you can do before they even get to the emergency department. So removing clothing and equipment, moving to a cool location um, is really helpful. Probably the most effective way to cool somebody down that's hyperthermic is cold water immersion. And this is just water, you know, 40, 50 degrees um, Fahrenheit, and you just put them in it up until, you know, their head and neck are out um, and that cools them down. We actually don't often use this in the emergency department, though, and that is just because these kiddos are sick, as we talked about, and they often they may need to be intubated. They need labs, they need fluids, they need continuous monitoring, and these things are just really challenging to do when your patient is floating in a pool of water. So what we tend to do is evaporative is um, use evaporative cooling to help. So we spritz them with water bottles and put big fans on them. Cold compresses or ice packs can be applied um, all over the body. They talk a lot about axilla and groin, um, but you can do it other places as well. And you wanna change those out really frequently as they warm up. Um, sometimes we'll do um, chilled IV fluids. There's no role for antipyretics in um, heat stroke hyperthermia. It just doesn't work. And sometimes um, they can risk further liver injury, kidney injury when you already have those things going on. Shivering can be your enemy. So it's, it's sometimes it's tricky to cool kids down and then they start shivering and then try to warm themselves back up again. So sometimes you need benzos um, or even paralysis and intubation if that's really a problem. You want to try to cool them down. We'll continuously monitor them with a, a temperature probe. Like you can use a rectal temperature probe and continuously monitor as you're cooling. And you really only need to bring them down to like 102 ish degrees. And then the hypothalamus can kick in after that and keep going. Obviously <clears throat> cooling is going to fix a lot of your problems, but this is a really sick patient. So you, you know, the ER loves their ABC. So they may need to be intubated. Um, they often need IV fluids. They may need pressors to support their blood pressure. Electrolyte derangements are very common and need to be corrected. And then you're drawing a lot of labs looking for end organ dysfunction. Um, so troponin, CK, ALT, AST, um, looking at kidney function, looking for coagulopathy, and um, certainly an EKG as well, doing whatever you can to address um, these issues as they arrive and support them through it. And then, of course, if they're having seizures, we treat those with benzos. Sometimes even um, ECMO is necessary. So how do these kids, these really sick kids do overall with heat stroke? Fortunately, many have complete recovery and it's, it's really amazing, um, but some do require prolonged hospitalizations. And unfortunately there can be significant morbidity. So lasting neurologic deficits, um, there's case reports of um, liver failure, even necessitating transplant um, and even death. So let's talk about our kiddo, uh, our 17 uh, year old that collapsed and was brought in. Um, so they were pulled in the emergency department using the mechanisms that I described earlier. They received fluid resuscitation for hypotension. Um, they were found to have elevated troponin, um, acute kidney injury, and a slightly elevated CK. And it was described their mental status improved um, even in the emergency department with, as their temperature came down. And they were admitted um, to our PICU and um, continued supportive care, and he was able to be discharged home um, in good condition. So it was a really uh, positive outcome for that one. Not to be a Debbie Downer, but just to contrast, it doesn't always work out so well. This is a case um, report from our institution in 2014, and I remember it well because 
um, when people in our division publish papers, there's a bulletin board where we hang them up. And it was like one of my first days in the office as faculty member. And I was like, oh, let me just read this paper. And it's this just horrifying, tragic story of, of a football player that collapses. And unfortunately, despite um, ECMO and dialysis, he worsened and died um, three days after presentation. So it's just really a dangerous thing. All right, so that's bad news. Uh, but the good news is, is that heat-related illness is absolutely preventable, and there's several ways we can all help. <clears throat> so first, we talk about athletes. Um, awareness of the risks and signs of heat illness by parents, pediatricians, teachers, coaches can help protect kids. Um, it must be recognized that fall athletes may be at high risk. Um, August is really hot. Um, there are published recommendations from the National Athletic Trainers Association, which include a 14-day period of acclimatization at the start of athletic seasons. Um, and so this includes resting periods, um, practices during cooler times of day, slowly increasing equipment worn during practice, and ensuring that coaches um, and parents and trainers are aware of this um, and recognize the signs and symptoms of heat-related illness can be life-saving given the time-sensitive nature. Um, and then of course, all the stuff that helps every problem, right? Being well hydrated, getting good sleep, eating healthy meals um, will be really helpful. This is just a graphic from a review article that I just thought was an interesting visual way of showing the acclimatization uh, regimen. And so this was adapted from the National Athletic Trainers Association position statement. And it's, it's for football and it shows how um, you know, on the far right there, you can see what equipment you're wearing. So you start with helmets only and you're adding shoulder pads and then you get to full pads. You're adding in practices, um, but you're scheduling in rests as well. And so this exists um, and it's uh, maybe helpful for folks to know, like when you're doing sports physicals um, in the summer. Generally, um, for everybody, I think this is reasonably common sense, but we have to stay, kids need to stay hydrated, uh, dress appropriately for the weather. I didn't talk about sunburn because I think we all know about it, but that's miserable. So applying sunscreen is, is really important. Planning rest time, um, having families watch out for concerning signs. Um, you know, everybody's kid can be a little bit uh, whiny sometimes. I know mine can, but if they've been outside playing um, a long time and it's really hot out and they're acting kind of weird, it's worth considering. Are they just too hot and they need to come inside? Um, pay particular attention to um, young people people or vulnerable folks that may not be able to express that they're too hot or move themselves inside. So for us, it's babies we got to worry about and then kiddos with special health care needs. This is a handout developed by some amazing physicians at, in Louisville, along with the Kentucky chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force on Child Health and Climate, with a lot of good information for families about how to protect kids from heat illness um, and so this and other resources are available on the KYAAP website, um, and you can use them if you're interested in your clinic. Um, and so they talk about heat illness, they talk about asthma, um, extreme weather, nutrition, the benefits of playing outdoors. Um, and so that's a great resource. Let's talk for a moment about vehicular heat stroke. Um, so this can happen to anybody is one of those things that like nobody is one of those things that's like, oh, this will happen to somebody else. Well, it just takes a second and it can happen, unfortunately. Um, and so reminding families to get in the habit of checking the back seat. And I think a way that's often recommended is just get in the habit of putting your bag or your purse or whatever in the back seat so that every day you have to get out and you have to check the back seat to grab your bag and you'll see your kid back there. So something as simple as just establishing that habit can, can be life saving. Um, of course, being careful with distractions in the car um, and then keeping your car locked when it's parked so that, you know, you can talk to your kids that cars are not for playing in. But again, if adult just remembers to lock their car and put their keys away, uh, kids can't get in there. Um, and as an ER doctor, I love this tip because, you know, these are things we see. If a child is missing, check the pool first and then check the car, including the trunk, because those are places where you got to find them fast. Um, so the National Highway Traffic Safety um, Administration, I think, I'm sorry, not association, has a, a big effort around vehicular heat stroke. And I think May 1st is actually vehicular heat stroke uh, prevention day. Um, but they've got a lot of great materials on their website, posters and whatnot. This is just a short one minute video. I thought I'd play it for you here. Let's see if we 
get lucky and it works. We said we'd never give in to a meltdown. Okay. And we'd yeah. never babysit with a screen. We said we'd never let the toys take over. Mariella. Never leave the house looking. Well. And never let them out of our sight. get hot fast and kids can be at risk before you leave the car always stop look lock all right i just thought that was kind of a, a cool spot there's a similar one where um she there's a mom that that you know gets a phone call and leaves her her baby in the car and you kind of see it from the backseat perspective of the kiddo and Fortunately, she comes to rescue them just as dad did just in time. Um, but it, it's just a, a nice reminder um, that we can help families remember. Okay, so there's some interesting system level prevention things. Um, so heat waves are actually a leading cause of weather related death. Um, but again, it's really preventable. So heat warning systems are helpful, especially when coupled, coupled with um, distribution of equipment like air conditioners or setting up cooling centers. And then like everything else, um, it's helpful to consider the social context. So this is actually an older paper, but I thought it was interesting. In Chicago in the mid nineties, there was a really bad heat wave. And unfortunately a lot of folks died, um, many of them elderly. And so there was a study that looked at, um, like a case control study that looked at factors that were associated with death in the, in the heat wave. Um, and of course, access to a working air conditioner is you know, makes a lot of sense. But there were other social things that were important, like access to transportation, having friends, having a social network, participating in group activities um, were found to, with a decreased uh, risk of death. Um, and so I think it's just important to remember uh, checking on vulnerable people, things we can do as a community um, can prevent this. So unfortunately, heat-related health concerns are not likely going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and as extreme heat events become more common, we need to consider the myriad effects that increasing heat has on child health. Um, and so I think about poor football coaches, depending on where they grew up and where they live now, if you're 50 years old and you're coaching, there may simply be more really hot days now than when they were young. Um, and so it's just uh, an important thing to consider when we're, we're thinking about safety in the heat. And I think it's important. I like this um, quote from the AAP, which is, you know, having been trained to understand child health through the lens of a stable climate, um, we must now learn to recognize, predict, and prevent child health risks that result from climate change. And so we should be aware that cities can be significantly warmer than the surrounding suburbs. Um, and this is due to a combination of factors, including less green space, um, buildings and asphalt that may absorb heat, um, and the presence of roadways, factories, and so it creates a so-called urban heat island. Now, I'm not suggesting we all go live in the forest like this picture suggests, but it is important to consider that folks that live in cities um, sometimes have to deal with the consequences of increased heat, including risk of heat-related illnesses um, that we've been discussing at higher rates than folks that um, live further out or in the suburbs. So I think this is an interesting tool um, that you can further explore if you're interested from the Centers for Disease Control. Um, and it shows the heat and health index at a zip code level. And so this index incorporates historical temperature, heat related illnesses, and then other community characteristics to identify areas that are most likely to experience negative health outcomes from heat. Um, and so recognizing that while heat affects us all, some kids bear a disproportionate burden. Um, in many cities, unfortunately, historically red line neighborhoods um, feel the greatest impact of heat. And we can see this in this map here. This is another publicly available tool if you're interested, and it's the EJ screen from the EPA. 
And it depicts several climate and environmental factors. So you can um, click through all kinds of different maps and look. Um, and so this one is number of extreme heat days. And so just in our area, you can see that the area around Louisville is hotter um, than even like once you get out into Middletown and Crestwood and um, you know surrounding areas are cooler. Um, so this population level information can be considered um, when planning prevention um, and can be important. And then I just wanted to show that the American Academy of Pediatrics has recently published a policy statement on climate change and children's health for those that are further interested in this um, health and health equity topic. So it discusses the impact of climate on children's physical and mental health, how it disproportionately burdens children in socially disadvantaged groups, amplifying existing inequities, and then offers solutions. So these recommendations highlight how pediatricians can advocate for kids on individual community and policy levels, which as we know is an important role that we have. So I will um, kind of pause there and, and summarize. So heat related illness um, is certainly a spectrum and it ranges from mild illness like rashes to really life threatening um, like heat stroke. Recognition and prompt cooling can save lives. The great news is that it is preventable um, but the bad news is that health inequities exist. Pediatricians absolutely can help them. I do want to acknowledge um, Dr. Libby Mims, Dr. Julia Richardson, and Dr. Letitia Dirks, who do amazing work on climate and child health. Um, that, they're where I got many of these um, resources, including the handout, um, and they worked with the, the Kentucky chapter at the AAP on. Um, and then, of course, I've got to always thank my amazing um, PEM colleagues and EMS colleagues who are always um, there and willing, ready to help at a moment's notice. Um, and so thank you for sharing um, that recent case with me and allowing me to talk about it. So I've got some references and I'm um, happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, the uh, talking about climate change, um, you know, I guess. Uh, you know, those people, you have a relationship with them. What are you all doing for climate change? Oh, that's a good one. Well, I think there's a lot of things. Um, so that's an excellent question. I'm just trying to think of how to break it down. I think, in, I think first of all, recognizing it in education is really important. So Dr. Dirks, I mentioned her work, it was her um, residency advocacy project was to educate families in the clinical space about climate and health and heat and what they could do to protect their kids. And then also like making that handout and making pediatricians aware of this is just kind of an emerging thing that we should be considering. Um, there's certainly other things as well, like talking to families about um, transportation that has impact on climate, looking at what we all do in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, if you're going to build a new building, what kind of materials are you using? Um, what about waste? Um, so just thinking about how we all contribute. Um, and then, of course, looking at the policy level, if people are interested in getting into that um, and examining um, how different policies impact the climate and then impact the inequities that we can see. Okay. And, uh, since there's there's you know been a lot of educated on education on heat related illnesses in the last you know five to ten years, are you seeing more or less despite the increase in temperature in general? More oh, more presentations. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have not looked at our numbers here, to be honest with you. Like for that one case report was from 2014. We had one this summer, you know. So I I don't know those really um, extreme ones. How often we're seeing them. Nationally, overall, um, emergency departments are seeing more heat-related illness. Okay. And what's the, uh, is there a maximum temperature that a patient gets that they're not salvageable? Um, I, I, you know, that's always hard to say, but I think, so we talked about the hypothalamus usually stops, um, it kind of runs off the rails around like that 42-ish degrees, that 106 there's some, there's different numbers in the literature, but if you're looking around 107, 108, that's where it's starting to become really, really dangerous. And it's a matter of, it just seems to be the longer you're at those really high temperatures, the more dangerous it is. Um, I, I would always hesitate to say nobody, somebody's not salvageable. You, you could see our patient that was over 107, obviously in a super dangerous zone. 
ended up doing well. Um, but you, you know, you just have to be really aggressive. And if somebody is unaware of how dangerous that is, that can turn into a bad situation quickly. Uh, is there any research around this? I think it'd be hard to randomize patients to different groups, et cetera. But is there any national research? I mean, some of the mechanisms are similar to malignant hyperthermia, but mm -hmm. I guess uh, no one's trying that treatment or anything. You know, there was some um, like dantrolene, different things have been tried and have not been found to be effective. Um, like even the like Tylenol and ibuprofen, right. and it just, yep. that, there just isn't a role for that. It's really cooling and supportive care. Um, and then probably the biggest role for medicines is um, combating shivering and seizures. So if you're gonna give anything, it's probably benzodiazepines um, or paralysis. If needed, but yeah, no, Dan Trillian tried and, and not helpful, it seems. But you're right, it's hard to, there's a lot of variables and hard to randomize, certainly. Right. <laughs> yeah, it'd have to be a multi center. All right. That's all the questions we have today. So thanks, thanks everyone so for joining us. Thanks, Dr. Anderson, for the. Yeah, my pleasure. Talk.